uh, gospel. And I want to continue uh, talking tonight. If you want to go with me in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to go there. Um, anybody cold in here? Raise your hand if you're cold. Oh, that's not enough. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Na, 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 na. I'm sorry. I'm going to pay that one. I know that's not very loving, is it? I'm sorry. Na, na, na. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 15, it says this. So as much as is in me, I am ready, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The Apostle Paul opens up Romans and he says it like this, I am so ready to preach the gospel because I want to see somebody's heart and life turned around. That's why he said, he said, I'm ready and I'm eager to preach the gospel. Why? Because it's got power, it's got energy, it's got dunamis in it to change somebody's life. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready to preach the gospel, the euangelon, the euangelon. This, this, uh, 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 this word euangelon, it, it's, it's the word means, uh, we get the word evangelism from it. It's the, go- the word gospel, euangelon in the Greek. It means good news, good message, a news of victory. Uh, 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 news that makes one happy, information that causes one joy. Amen. And listen, and I, you can go back and listen to last week's message. The gospel in one word is Jesus. He is the good news. All that he's done, all that he's accomplished, it's good news. Amen. But, you know, the thing is, you, you and I have to realize something, uh, is that, is that, you're going to, listen, when you start sharing the gospel, you're going to be rejected by people. Okay? You need to get this in you. You are going to be rejected at times. Look what the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to go through this real quick in Acts 28. This is at the very end of the book of Acts. It says, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him. This is when he was in prison. He was in her house arrest. Uh, they appointed him a day. And they, and many came to him at the lot at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Verse twenty four. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some what? This is the apostle Paul wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Right? He said some believed what I had to say, and some didn't believe what I had to say. So don't get down. Even the Apostle Paul was rejected. If you look at the next verses I gave, I think it was verse 30 or something like that. It says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. He didn't let it stop him. You see that? He didn't didn't let it stop him. He he, he said, you know what? I'm not going to let it stop me. If someone rejects me, someone rejects me. Someone mocks me, someone mocks me. See, mocking and, and, and deriding and all this stuff was something that's always happened. I, I found this. I found this. This is the earliest. Put this picture up. This is the earliest depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus right here. It was on a wall in Rome, and it's actually in a museum now. And it's a little blurry here, but uh, you can kind of see it. But this was the wall. This is what somebody just pulled out to be able to clarify it. But, but this is a mockery. And let me just read here a second about this. This is called Alex Minos Graffito. It's what it's called. Which Graffito Blasphemo, the blasphemous graffiti. Now listen, it's a piece of Roman graffiti scratched in plaster on the wall of a, of, of a room near the Palest- Palatine Hill in Rome, which has now been removed and is in the Palatine Hill Museum. It may be the earliest surviving depiction of Jesus, 200 A.D. The image seems to show a young man worshiping a crucified donkey-headed figure. Now, a donkey-headed figure to Rome, it was a disgrace. Now, listen now. The Greek inscription, and you can kind of see it's wrote here, it, 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 it possibly translates to this. Alex Minos worships his God. If you notice, he's got a hand kind of up right here like this. This guy was being made fun of, and it was inscribed. 
Alex Minnows. Some believe that he was actually one of the pages for the Roman government. And could have been a young kid, maybe even maybe a teenager or an or early, or a early adult uh, or a young adult. And, and this depiction is, is someone being mocked for their faith. What was, what was funny, though, is because they, the historians, what I read, the historians found in another room this inscription. It was only an inscription in a different hand type of handwriting. Alex Minos is faithful. Maybe he's the one that inscribed that into those walls. As he was being mocked, as he was being, uh, 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 as he was being uh, derided for his faith. What am I trying to get across to you? Listen, being persecuted has always been a part of sharing the gospel. Get used to it. We can't stand it if someone talks bad about us. People have been burnt at the stake for the gospel. Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. People burned. People sent sewed in sewed in, in 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 animal skins and thrown to the in the Colosseum to the wolves as everybody watched them eat the Christians. What am I trying to tell you? When you got something and something so transformed your life, you'll tell anybody about it and it doesn't matter. I'm questioning tonight. Now listen, is that I wonder how much we love Jesus because we let stuff shut us down. Come on now. Do you know what the early, you know what the early church had? They had a they had they had an encounter with a resurrected Christ. They didn't have a book. They had a they had an encounter and they shared it. It's the same gospel church. It's the same Jesus and the same don't get mad. No, that's kind of somber. Everybody's like, it's good. It's the good news. I'm giving you good news. I promise. So I want you to understand something tonight that when you start sharing the gospel with people, people are not going to always like what you have to say. All right? Now, listen, we've already talked about this already, but the gospel has to be, there's content with the gospel. Okay? And the gospel has to be, it has to be spoken out. It's not just enough to live it in front of somebody. You need to speak it out. I'm not making sense to you here. It's not just enough for you saying, I'm living an exemplary life. Praise the Lord. The gospel should produce a good life. But a good life is not enough. We have to share. How can they hear? We've already read it in Romans 10 last week. How can they hear without someone to proclaim it? People need to hear words to be saved. Amen. People need to hear words to be saved. So I'm trying to refresh ourselves in this over the weeks to come. Now, I pulled, uh, Marianne got this for me today from the, when we do the photo booths and stuff. But what I'm trying to do is just give you the, the framework. See, what it looks like on the inside. <laughs> Take a picture of me, Tim. What it looks like on the what it looks like on the inside for you, how you share your faith is all going to be different for everybody. But the framework I'm sharing with you is trying to give you something that you can start ask, uh, answering questions inside this fra- a- answering questions inside this framework that people are asking. I'm making sense to you. So this whole thing I'm sharing with you about gospel, the good news, and stuff I'm going to start sharing tonight, it's just a framework. It's just a framework. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's a framework. Amen. Now, this is the gospel. Let me give you this. Go ahead and bring, let's bring that up here real quick. Uh, and you can do this. This is the gospel. They're going to bring this up here for me. And Adam, you can help. Well, here comes Shane. He can, he can help. This is the gospel in 30 words. And this is the framework we're going to be working with over the next weeks to come. All right? This is it. The gospel in 30 words. You ready? 
It's Jesus is God, because the gospel is Jesus, right? Jesus is God with us, okay? Come to show us God's love, save us from sin, set up God's kingdom, shut down religion so that we can share in God's life. That's the gospel in 30 words, and that's what we're going to start sharing. This is the framework. And tonight, I want to talk to us about how God, Jesus is God with us. This is, this is the ground of the gospel. Everything is coming out of the soil of this thing right here. And it's up to you and I to understand this. Go with me to Matthew chapter 1 real quick. Matthew chapter 1. Can I get a good amen? Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 1. We're, we're getting ready to come up on uh, Christmas. We're not too far away. How many? I mean, someone has to know how many more Fridays we have till Christmas or something. Anybody have an idea? All right, well, good. Praise the Lord. All right, we've still got Thanksgiving to go. I'm, I like that. Matthew 1, 23, we are, uh, this is a verse that's read right at Christmas time. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. Now, I know this seems elementary, but we need to, we need to go over it. Jesus' name, it says, is what? God with us. His name's going to be what? Emmanuel. God with us. So tonight we're going to talk about the incarnation. The incarnation is a fancy word meaning this. God in flesh. That's what it means. The incarnation, big fancy word, theological word, incarnation, which means God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. Matthew 1 is quoting here from Isaiah 7. Now, this is significant. Again, this is the heart of the gospel. Ground zero of the gospel. It's the epicenter of the waves, of the shock waves of the gospel that's going to be shared from here in the, in the weeks to come. It's coming out of the soil of Jesus is God with us. He's God with us. With us. Now I want you to know something. God didn't send, when God didn't send a pamphlet, when he wanted to send the good news, he didn't send a pamphlet. No. He didn't send a computer screen. He didn't have you download an app. When, when, when God wanted to get the good news to you, he sent a person. God cares enough about us that we can see face to face who Jesus, who he is. Who God, hey, I'm going to send you not paper. I'm not even going to, listen, the paper wasn't even enough. The book wasn't even enough. The Old Testament wasn't even enough. It wasn't even enough. The Christmas event of Christ's birth, J.I. Piker says, is where the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. Nothing is fiction Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the incarnation. What's he saying? He said, listen, this is where everything changed. Everything changed with the incarnation. Now, go with me to Luke chapter 10. We're going to lay this out just a little bit. You'll see this again. I'm talking about tonight the gospel in 30 words. Jesus is what? God with us. The framework, the first thing, that Jesus is God with us. In Luke chapter 10, we have a parable that Jesus tells in verse 30. And Jesus answered and said, we don't have time to break this whole, da- whole thing down. A certain man, you see that? It says what? A certain man, you need to pay attention to that certain man. And a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem is a type. Uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of heaven. Jericho is a type of the earth, right? It, it says, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Je- Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him, what? Half dead. This is, this is what? This is Adam. Adam was heaven born. Right? Put on the earth. God breathed into his nostrils. This certain man is a type of Adam. And he fell among thieves. Who's the thief? The devil. 
The thief cometh not, cometh not but for what? To steal, kill, and destroy. And when Satan deceived Adam and Eve, right, they became half dead. He died, they died, Adam, and Adam died spiritually. He didn't die physically then, but he was half dead. Right? I, can't, I could just talk about this for a really long time. Now, look what it says in verse 31. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. See, religion can never help you. The do's and the don'ts couldn't help any. Listen, you, everybody wants to try to legislate morality. You can't legislate morality. We got this all wrong in America. We think that we can legislate people to do Listen, the more you tell somebody they can't do something, guess what's going to happen? They're going to do it. You can't legislate morality. And listen, you can, and I'm not, you can ban abortion and all that, but I'll guarantee you somebody's going to continue to have an abortion because you can't, it's got to be a heart change. I'm not making sense. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not for abortion. I'm just saying because you can't legislate that kind of stuff. You think that just because you put a law in, it's going to cause a, somebody to change their heart? Absolutely not. It's going to want to do it more. That's what the law does. Right? Religion can help you. It always passes by on the other side. It always looks down. Always, well, you know what? You ought to be able to help. Look, don't you know you ought to help yourself? Look at this guy. Right? So much you could say. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. Everybody say a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came where? He came where he was. He came to him. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? The Samaritan. Jesus was identifying himself with the Samaritan. Jesus is God with us. He came to me. He came to me. This is the good news. He came to me. Amen. See, we've made it all about. Now, you go, I've used this illustration, but I'm going to do it again. So we call the bridge to life. And, and, and it's good. You got us. You got God. And there's a great chasm between us. Right? And then we know Jesus, and we could do all this stuff, right? And, and how Jesus comes, builds the bridge, right? It's, there's value in this. Right? And then, you know, I'm not the greatest. We, get, we accept Christ and we become, you know, we become saved and, right, come to God. But we're missing it. This is only, this is the deal. It's all about us trying to get to God. Where is that the good news? You guys aren't hearing what I'm saying. See, the thing is, God, what? He came to me first. And then he grabbed me. By the hand, and we came across. See, religion always tries to get us to understand, well, you need to do more. And I'm, there's value in this, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, God came to me first. The Samaritan came to, 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 to the wounded, half-dead man. He's the one that came to him. This is the good news. Listen, you need to get this in you because someone's, it's going to come up in a conversation. The incarnation. Amen. See, when you, when you start, listen, this is why I'm teaching you this. Because when you start understanding the incarnation, 
and people start understanding the true meaning of the incarnation, see, their ears are open to the good news and they're more receptive to hear about the rest of it. Most people have bad thoughts about God. Yep, all kinds of crazy ideas. But the incarnation clears it up. Uh, put the picture up there, uh, Marianne, with the shadow. See, everybody always tries to, the, the, sh the shadows, right? The shadows. But see, the thing, what causes a shadow? Something gets in the way of the light. Now, if you don't pay attention, you'll miss the real thing. Am I making sense to you here? Yeah. You, you'll miss it because you're, you're always focused on the shadow. I can't see really Jesus. I can't really see him clearly. In the Old Testament, it was like that. It was like a strobe light. They, 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 it, was, it was light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Light, dark. We have stuff in Scripture in the Old Testament, stuff like, uh, you know, that God made people blind. There are Scriptures that say that. And if you don't watch out, the shadows will keep you from actually seeing the true image. Oh, amen. That's good. The incarnation clears it all up for you and I. Because people have lots of ideas of who God is. Come on. I mean, that's the truth. And people are convinced about stuff that's not true about God. They're just focused on the shadows. Well, God took this person and God took my kid. and Right? I mean, Barry was telling me just, he said, you know, I was at, he was at 180 yesterday. And he said, man, he said it was phenomenal. Uh, up to GW, he said, uh, he said, I couldn't even get taught teach him because one of the girls, she said, listen, I had a, a little, I have a friend and so, so and so, that they're, something by that they're, they were born, you know, with their, you know, maybe some type of problems with their limbs. Why did God make them like that? Now, that's a question, correct? But see, if you don't understand the incarnation, see, you're going to come up with all kinds of bizarre, bizarre things about who God is. That are not even true. Amen. I'm making sense to you guys. See, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look what the Bible says here. This is the enemy's pl plot and ploy. He says, but if even if our gospel, the good news, right, is veiled, it is veiled to those who what? Are what? Perishing. Why? Look at the next verse. Verse 4. Who's what? Minds. The God of this age, talking about Satan, has blinded these minds who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Now look, the light of the glory of the uh, glory of Christ is the what? You want to see the image of God? Look at the light of Jesus. The enemy's job is is to blind people's minds from the true image of who God is. That's what he done with Adam and Eve. Well, did God really say that? And will God really do that? Making them, him, them question the integrity of who God is. Man, this is so important. The incarnation clears it up. Jesus is God with us. Amen. See, what I love, what I love is that when I start seeing this picture, I start wanting to fall in love with Jesus again. He, 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 he came to me. Amen. He came to me. I didn't come, listen, you said I got born. I made, yeah, you made the decision, but Jesus come looking for you. He's the one that came, showed up at your house knocking on your door. Right? 
No, no, no. You say, well, you know, no, he found you. Even in your darkest moment. Listen, I want you to get a hold of this. I can preach right now. I'm telling you, even in your darkest moment, God never lost sight of who you were. He never lost sight that you were a son. He never lost sight of it. Never. Even in your darkest moments, when you were the farthest thing away, he said, I'm going to send my son. He's going to get my kids back because I see who they are. Jesus came to me. He came knocking on my door. He came looking for me. I didn't come looking for him. Matter of fact, he showed up when I really wasn't looking for him at all. (laughs) Come on now. All kinds of crazy stuff about God. I I showed this picture at Easter, but it comes back to my mind again, and I wanted to show it again. The, the, The bus. Now, this was an atheist campaign, I think it was in England, and they were, they, you know, put these things and rent, rented space. Can you guys see that? Rented space to be able to, 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 to advertise. So it says, there's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. Really, it doesn't bother me, right, there's probably no God, because that's, that's their opinion. But what really bothers me, they're trying to get another thing across. That if there is a God, then we need to worry because you're never going to enjoy your life. Do you see where the perversion is? Huh? Huh? Listen. If there's no God, I probably need to worry. I probably need to worry. (laughs) Right? If they're, listen, the enemy wants to pervert it. Listen, we got all kinds of crazy thoughts about God. God's got a big mallet. He's a whack-a-mole. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that's the thought patterns. Yeah, and you know what? I need to worry because you know what? He's definitely wanting to send everybody to hell. That's not the case. If that was the case, he should have never sent the rescue plan. Well, God's just out to get me. I can't enjoy my life. Are you kidding me? Well, I can't enjoy my life. I get saved. You're, you're under the deception uh, alive, the enemy. He's blinding your minds because the best life is with him. I'm talking tonight about the incarnation. So the incarnation reveals a few things here. What, what we're, so this is what we're trying to digest, okay, in order for us to be able to get this framework. That way we can share about this type of things with the people that we're talking to. The incarnation reveals, number one, who the Father is. Again, coming off of that. Because, listen, people don't know what God looks like. But he sent the, his son... In flesh, that way there is no question. There's never a question again. The Bible says that, and well, actually, Hebrews chapter 1, up on the screen real quick, we'll just go here. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, somebody by the Old Testament, hath in these last days, since Jesus came, has spoken to us by his what? His son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Verse 3. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Strong words. Strong words. The writer of Hebrews trying to get something to cross. He said, listen, God has spoken. And he, he, he has spoke to you and I through his son. And his son is the radiance of the Father's glory. His son is is the radiance of God. It's the focal point, the reflection of who God is. Amen. He's the expressed image. You see that word, express image? That's that word we get, it's it's character. It's it's, it's to mean to engrave. It means to actually, uh, to, 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 to an exact impression, a mold. Or a die. Something that's poor. It's the mold. If you want to know what God looks like, the Father, all you got to do is look to Jesus. There's never another question. Did you, let, me, let me ask you something. Did, did Jesus ever send a tornado or a hurricane? 
He calmed them. <laughs> but what are they going to call this hurricane that ripped through just a little while, a few hours ago? What are they going to call that? An act of what? That's not an act of God. That's an act of the devil. Because you never see Jesus. Well, you know what? We didn't get a good hurricane. These people down there need to, you know what? That, you know what? In New Orleans, that's a, that's a vow sinning place. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to send my judgment. I'm going to send the judgment. That's what we hear all the time. We got prominent ministers that stand up on television. That's the judgment of God. Jesus was already judged. He's in a, God's in a good mood. But we're, we're being convinced of stuff. And what it is, it's keeping our hearts away from the Father. It's keeping us from going to Papa. Oh yeah, yeah. Remember James. Remember James and John. We call them the we're, we're the sons of thunder. Want to call down fire? Let's just scorch them all like a bunch of French fries. Let's do it, Lord. Let's do it. What he said? He said, "You don't know what spirit you are. You don't even know." Listen, that's not. This is good news. Right. It's good news. That's right. It's good news. And Jesus is the good news. He came to me. He, and he came to me. The incarnation is about, the incarnation is about showing us who the Father is. The Bible says that Jesus is the Alpha and what? Omega. Alpha, the Greek. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Jesus is the A to Z of God. So when God wanted to spell it out, we all just need some help sometimes. Well, I need some help sometimes. How about you? Can you spell that for me? And listen, Sunday morning, when I was saying yurtle, it was yurtle the turtle, not urinal the turtle. Because everybody, did you say urinal? Urinal? Urinal. Yurtle. Can you spell that for me? Y-E-R-T-L-E. Something like that. But sometimes you've got to have somebody spell it out for you. He said, well, listen, I'm going to give you the A to Z. His, his name is J-E-S-U-S. -S. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. And the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. The Message Bible says Jesus moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> Amen. See, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this in Christ, in Jesus Christ, the reality of God entered, entered, to the, entered into the reality of this world. He is the essence. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the icon, the image, the icon, which means the high definition projection. Listen, when you get Jesus, you don't get standard definition. You get high definition. When you see Jesus, you see him. You see the Father. John 1.18, I could preach, I could run, because Jesus is so wonderful. John 1, 18, no one has seen, this is a remarkable statement, no one has seen God at what? Any time. No one. What about Moses? What about Abraham? David. We go right down the line. It says no one has seen him. They saw glimpses of him. The only begotten Son who's in the heart of the Father, He has explained Him. That's what the word declare means. It means to explain in its finest details. Go look it up. It means the minute, very finest details. Jesus tells us who the Father is. The incarnation is important because we see who the Father really is. Amen. Number two, the incarnation reveals that God is for me, not against me. He 
came to me. He came to me. So it's God tell me, I must have some value. And, and, and he's for me, not against me. Why would he come rescue me if he didn't, if he had something against me? He's not. God stepped down into our brokenness, into our weakness, into our pains, into our struggles. Amen. God really likes you. Won't you just say this? Say, God really likes me. He loves you. He loves hanging out with you. He lives in you. Amen. He really, really likes you. He's not against you. He is for you. He's actually with me. God is with me. Amen. It proves to me. Real quick, Hebrews chapter 2, up on the screen. i got to read this. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became what? Flesh and blood. For, as, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Powerful, I can't stop. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. My, my. We also know that the Son of God not come to help angels. He come to help the descendants of Abraham. They're talking about all of us. Therefore, if it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God, that he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Verse 18. Since he himself has gone through the suffering and the testing, he's able to help us when we are being tested. He's for me. He's for me, not against me. Amen. Number three. Jesus came to show me how to live. The, the incarnation reveals to me how I need to live. Right? See, this is what, when you, when you see the incarnation, what you're seeing, guys, you're seeing what it's like for a man to walk with God. Never, never since the Garden of Eden, never, never has there been a man with the Spirit of God living on the inside since Adam and after, before, before he sinned. Now you wonder why the storm clouds started brewing over him. That's why they wanted to kill him. That's why they want. That's why. That's why. That's why. That's why. Uh, 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 Pharaoh or was it Pharaoh? Yeah, yeah. Pharaoh. They wanted to kill him. Kill all the kids. Kill all the kids. Two years old. No, let's kill them all. The storm clouds were brewing. Why? Wow, they knew this is a man that's walking with God, and he was here to show us this: how to live, how to live. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount. Listen. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the kingdom manifesto. Listen, if you have any part of your Bible and that's all you had, you would want Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7 because that's Jesus' kingdom manifesto. It was his, he was telling you and I how this new covenant philosophy is to work. He was introducing things to us that were completely different. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. You heard it said, but I say. Jesus was turning the thing upside down. And he was showing you and I how to live. We are called to follow in his steps. Amen. Showing us how to live spiritually, aware, understanding the kingdom of God and also the kingdom of darkness. This is what Jesus did. The incarnation is powerful. It's more than just him dying to go to a cross. I get it. It's important. But there's so much more that's happening in between. He's showing you and I how to live. The greatest depiction of love is Jesus forgiving his enemies. What was he doing? He was showing us that we could love our enemy. We could bless those that curse us. Showing me how to live. The incarnation was showing me a man that has the Spirit of God living in him. Guess what you are? You are a human with the Spirit of God living in you. Amen. Amen. 
He was modeling us what a relationship with God looks like. He was listening to the Father as much as I could say. He was hearing. He said, I, can, I can't do anything. I can't. I mean, this is a remarkable statement. Jesus said, I can't do anything with I can't do anything without him. I only do what I, I, I see him do. I only say what I hear him say. That's Jesus. Why? Because he was in, he was, he had a flesh and bone, blood body. He was a human. Sinless, yes, but he was a human. The incarnation was about God getting back into an earth suit. That way authority could be operated. He's shown us how to live, how to operate in authority, how to cast out devils, how to lay hands on sick people. He's shown us his life. The incarnation is more about baby Jesus in a manger. He came here to show us how to live. You can't understand the gospel until you understand the, the, the birth, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But we all make it about the death, burial, and resurrection. I get it. It's important. But there's so much more that's going on in between. It's the incarnation. People are going to wonder, I'm giving you a framework. He's come to show me how to live. Listen, people don't have a problem with Jesus. People don't have a problem with Jesus. They think Jesus is cool. True. They don't have a problem with Jesus. They have a problem with religion. Amen. They have a problem with Christians always pointing their finger. Well, you got to do that. And you better cut your hair. Or you better not cut your hair. What about those tattoos? Right? Rules. It's what crucified Jesus. Don't ever forget what the incarnation's about. And Jesus is an enemy lover. Lovers of those that nobody else wanted any association with. He was the friend of sinners. But he didn't stay in the gutter with them. He can, you can be a friend of sinners and not be in the gutter with them. I'm not here to give you a hand out. I'm here to give you a hand up. Jesus will get in your dirt for a time period, but he will not leave you there. He's always calling you to something better, and he's always calling you to something greater. He came. Man, I'm telling you, he's shown us how to live. And the last thing is this. I'm done. Last thing about the incarnation. The incarnation reveals a continuing incarnation. What are you saying, Pastor? A continuing incarnation. Well, when he got up, he sent the Spirit, and he got back on the inside of us. The Word is continually becoming flesh all the time in our lives. The incarnation shows us how to live. And when the Spirit of God comes on the inside of you, you now can manifest Jesus to the world. Amen. Apostle Paul said this. He said, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Amen. You can become incarnate to the world. What was incarnate? God what? When you start loving people, guess what happened? When you love your enemy, guess what just happened? Incarnation happened. God flesh when you forgive and you move past and move on right and you reconcile guess what happened incarnation just happened word just became flesh right when you go and start praying for somebody guess what just happened the word's becoming flesh and it's dwelling among people think about all of us in this room Individually and corporately. There's so much power. There's so much power in this room. There's so much power here. Jesus lives in you. And we are, as a church, becoming incarnate.
the word becoming flesh. Amen. Come on now. I want the word become flesh all the time. How about you? Hmm? The incarnation reveals a continuing incarnation. The glory of God filling the earth like the water cover the sea. Amen? So, the, so what's the incarnation for? I'm done. Revealing the Father. Right? God is for us, not what? Against us. The incarnation reveals how to live. And the incarnation reveals a continuing incarnation. Amen. That's good, isn't it? So much to say. Hallelujah. All right, close your Bible. Or your iPad. Value in this right here, church. A lot of value. Come on, let's play something. There's a lot of value in this right here. I'm not trying to make light of that. Okay? But before I ever cross the bridge... Jesus came to me. And I like that. He comes to take me by the hand. And let me lead you to the Father. <laughs> People are so confused today what Jesus, what the Father looks like. Just look at Jesus. Hey, well, I, I thought God made people sick. Did Jesus ever do that? Nope, he never made somebody sick. He what? He healed him. Who's the one that calls sickness disease? Well, you better say it. I'm about to slap you right now. <laughs> Who is it? Satan. If it's stealing, killing, destroying, it's from the enemy. You say, well, pastor, I had this. Listen, I've had stuff happen in my life too. I get it. I don't have every answer. But see, it, my situation, I can never elevate my situation. I can't make my situation theology. The minute you start elevating your situation and making it your theology, the next thing you know, it gets all messed up. Jesus is my theology, and he's perfect theology. Just keep your eyes on him. I guarantee you, man, it's good, isn't it? It's good news. I said it's good news. It's good news. Stand to your feet. Father, thank you for the good news. Thank you so much for the good news. Come on, won't you just thank the Father today that he sent his son Jesus, the incarnation, that God is with us. Emmanuel, I can never, ever, ever question again. It's clear. I don't focus on the shadows. I focus upon the real thing. Hallelujah. Now, I don't have to embrace shadows anymore because the real thing is here. Hallelujah. I don't hug stand. I don't I don't hug shadows. I hug people. And I can cast a shadow, Father. But it's not me. It gives forms of me, but the real person when I walk in the room. So tonight, Lord, I pray that we would all understand as we put the framework of the gospel together that the incarnation is the soil by which everything else grows out of. Jesus, you came to this earth. You died and you were buried and you rose again. You are living. No other God on earth has ever done that. <laughs> no, nope. every other religion, nothing else. Nope. We serve a living, a living God. Father, I thank you that we serve a living Savior. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful today that we can know exactly who you are like. That I don't have to have misconceptions, wrong conclusions that keeps me from my loving Father. Hallelujah. Because Jesus clears it up. Hallelujah. I know you're for me and you're not against me. You show me how to live. I want to follow in your footsteps. And Lord, today, as I follow in your footsteps, I pray the word will become incarnate again. It will become flesh again. That the world can see who the Father is. That you're for him, not against him. That people can we can show people how to live. And we can be 
come those that will be disciple makers. That they can begin to go in the word becoming flesh. I just thank you, Lord. I bless, Lord, this congregation tonight. And we give you the praise.